Hello and welcome to the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies Open Seminar Series for 2014-15. My name is Hannah Curtis and I'm the organiser of the series for this academic year. The Open Seminars are a series of seminars that take place through the academic year roughly on a monthly basis and they are an opportunity for us to invite speakers to talk on a subject of interest to them that has links to psychoanalysis. The series is open to all members of the university, students and staff, and also to the general public. The seminars are regularly attended by people who work in the local community, usually in a clinical field to do with mental health and well-being. People such as counsellors, psychotherapists, psychologists and mental health professionals. As the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies grows, many of our courses and our open seminar series are of interest to an ever-widening group of professional colleagues throughout the health and care sector. Sometimes the speakers are academics within the Centre for Psychoanalytic Studies, sometimes they are in other departments in the University of Essex, and sometimes they are speakers who may or may not be academics from outside of the university. This year we have Professor Stephen Growark talking about war and maturity from a psychoanalytic perspective. We have Joachim Willemsen who is on the academic staff in the centre discussing the thinking of Lacan in relation to clinical work. We have Jim Hopkins who is looking at the first year of life from the perspective of neurological developments and psychological developments. And this is just in the first term. In the second term, Christina Wieland, who has just published an important book on the fascist state of mind, will discuss the development of masculinity. From that point on, we have members of the academic team presenting a range of papers on their chosen research. And this will be an opportunity to hear what the academic staff are thinking about and questioning and also to get to know the academic staff from this perspective a bit more fully. As ever, it promises to be a stimulating series that will give rise to many interesting questions, opinions and hopefully some very good arguments. We will also be able to learn a great deal from people who have put time and energy and commitment into researching and writing about a particular subject and its links with psychoanalysis. We very much hope to see you at the open seminars and that you will also benefit from being able to watch and listen again to the talks and discussions. Thank you. So this evening we've got Professor Stephen Rowick. Uh, Stephen Roke is a professor of social thought at Roehampton University and a member of the British Psychoanalytical Society and the International Psychoanalytical Association. He's held honorary appointments with Central and Northwest London Mental Health NHS Trust at Parkside Clinic and St Charles Hospital and currently works in private practice in London. <coughs> His publications include Managed Lives, Psychoanalysis, Inner Security and the Social Order and he's recently contributed to a definitive scholarly edition of the collective writings of D.W. Winnicott with the Oxford University Press. Um, and his theme is the discursive engagement of psychoanalysis with the war effort. Shall I read your abstract so that, or are you going to, okay. The contribution of psychoanalysis to our understanding of war has received a good deal of attention in the wake of Freud's hypothesis of the death drive. He says, I'm not interested here, however, in the Freudian interpretation of war or the application of instinct theory to military conflict. I shall focus instead on the event of war as an object of psychoanalytical investment and I shall take Winnicott's discussion of war aims, 1940, as an example of the analytic preoccupation with the object and activity of war. Written during the Second World War, Winnicott's paper crucially identified war aims with our aims in proposing the value of keeping 
our war aims as simple as possible. In her reflections on the Gulf War and the threat of total militarization in the context of nuclear weaponry, Hannah Siegel proposed, rightly, I believe, that coming to terms with the prospect of one's own personal death is a necessary step in maturation. Winnicott didn't see war as necessarily inimical to such an eventuality. In fact, I shall argue that he perceived war as a way out of our immaturity. Um, so Professor Groat will speak for a, a, about 40 minutes or so, and then we will be able to have a discussion taking us up to 6.30. Psychotic theories about war, I want to suggest, form part of the discourse of war, and as such, contribute to the wider political debate regarding the legitimate use of violence. This debate, in turn, throws light on the question of value, and in particular, what is due to the enemy in the context of war. In the past, as Max Weber pointed out, in a lecture delivered at Munich University in 1918, and these dates will become important, Weber claimed the most varied institutions have known the use of physical force as quite normal, whereas today, 1918, the relationship between the state and violence is especially is especially intimate one. For Weber, the state rightfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force in territories under its jurisdiction. Consequently, when psychoanalysis is brought to bear on the relation on the related questions of war and violence, it inevitably enters into a dialogue with the state. War was certainly a catalyst at various points in Freud's own work, 1915 and 1933, Thoughts of War and so on, and proved decisive in the formulation of the death drive. In privileging the hypothesis of the death drive, however, psychoanalytic ideas about war since Freud have adopted a narrow focus. The application of Freudian instinct theory, this is to repeat in a sense what Hannah's just said, but in a sentence. The application of Freudian instinct theory to military conflict encourages a preoccupation with so-called psychotic factors affecting war and institutional violence. Now to be clear, and this is important really as a way of orientating myself to what I want to say, and, and perhaps to help orientate yourselves in listening. I'm interested in the discursive engagement of psychoanalysis with the war effort, as distinct from the merits of different psychoanalytical theories about war. An evaluation of various post-Freudian perspectives on war is not my topic here, at least. Nevertheless, there are ways of addressing war from a psychoanalytic perspective without recourse to the notion of innate sadism. In this respect, my comments are based uh, largely on Winnicott's paper, Discussions of War Aims, from 1940. And again, this isn't to suggest that Winnicott's reflections on war are particularly insightful, but rather that they represent a psychoanalytic attitude to war in which the spontaneous violence of life is prioritised over the death instinct as a primary source of aggression. In fact, I don't think that Winnicott has anything more or less illuminating to say about war than Freud or Klein. Whereas I do think that the shift in focus from the power to hurt and damage one's early internal object on the one hand, to the violence of life at the beginning on the other, augments or extends the theory of value in important and original ways. My reading of Winnicott is based on two basic distinctions, namely the distinction between violence and brutality and the distinction between maturity and necessity. The former rests on Winnicott's ideas about spontaneity and primary creativity. The latter, I would suggest, puts Winnicott at odds with Freud. And just to mention Freud really here to clarify the difference, Although an advance to maturity is implicit in the Freudian interpretation, so there is a concept of maturity in Freud's model of psychosocial development, so to speak, the discipline of necessity in Freud explicitly underwrites the reality principle in his late works. By contrast, Winnicott formulated a psychoanalytic model grounded on creativity, based on creativity and maturity, 
As regards the reflections on war, my main argument is that Winnicott employed maturity as a criterion of health. His, his words, as a criterion of health, alongside an understanding of violence as a spontaneous gesture of life. The argument, the main argument of this talk, the argument rests on two basic propositions. Firstly, that Winnicott revised the sociological thematic of the Freudian interpretation as a permanent task of social defence. And this revision applies both to war and to antisocial behaviour in Winnicott's case. Second, second basic proposition, that Winnicott retained the aggressive or destructive element in his account of, primit in his account of the primitive love impulse, the primitive love impulse, while at the same time revising the Freudian conjunction of culture and civilization. Uh, and Winnicott revises that from the standpoint of illusion. I mean, very simply, and it, you know, maybe it's something we can talk about uh, when, when we, when we uh, get into a conversation, but for Winnicott, illusion precedes the drives, to say it simply. Taken together, uh, these revisions uh, seem to me to augment the critical reach of psychoanalysis as a theory of value. So it's not that I'm uh, contrasting and seeing one theory of war as better or worse than another, but trying to extrapolate from Winnicott's reflections on war a particular theory of value. And it's the theory of value in Winnicott that I'm interested in that arises in his reflections on war. He calls his reflections on society, in fact, more generally as he calls them. So turning to the 1940 article, uh, The Discussion of War Aims, Concentrating on military aims and objectives, Winnicott sought to identify the war effort in strategic terms, again Winnicott's phrase, distinct from any moral justification. The basic distinction between strategic and non-strategic arguments, or between political calculations and moral values, proved decisive in the context of war. On the grounds that war is about fighting to win, Winnicott endorsed Churchill's decision at the time not to discuss war aims beyond the fact that, quote, we fight to win. T.S. Eliot, in his note on war poetry in London Calling from 1942, proposed much the same, emphasising the, the strategic nature of war as, quote, a situation rather than a life. A situation rather than a life. The problem of war, as uh, Eliot defined it, <coughs> is best dealt with by, quote, ambush and stratagem. And it's the uh, verdict to which Edmund Blunden came uh, in 1928 with the phrase, the war must be attended to. And although it does have, it does have moral as well as legal implications, particularly with respect to the identification of the enemy, the emphasis on strategy doesn't amount to a moral argument. This, at least, is how Winnicott proceeds initially in terms of the strategic conception of war aims. The further question of legal sanction and human rights, I've been walking up and down the corridor for the last 20 minutes, so I'm attuned to much of what seems to be going on, at least on notice boards. But the further question of legal sanction and human rights, which is especially urgent in determining whether collateral damage, quote, to civilians is excessive in relation to any, quote, anticipated military advantage isn't addressed explicitly at any point in Winnicott's 1940 article. Brutal violence against non-combatants isn't taken into consideration as part of the so-called problem of war. Winnicott didn't consider proportionality, quote, as part of the strategic calculation, but counted military advantage as a seemingly unproblematic expression of war aims. While it doesn't address the problem of war crimes from the perspective of international law, the strategic argument is nonetheless directly concerned with the question of, quote, military advantage. Thus, arguing in terms of fighting to win, Winnicott claimed that he wasn't ashamed in assuming a strategic attitude towards the war. This is a direct quote. We are doing no extraordinary thing to fight simply because we do not wish to be exterminated or enslaved, end of quote. 
the wish expressed in this claim presupposes a particular theory of human development. A theory which differs significantly from the Freud Klein perspective on Oedipal and pre configurations or formations, structures, processes. Winnicott's claim about fighting to win presupposes the vital normativity of the individual environment set up, the basic idea of life as activity grounded in ruthless striving. Now, to avoid confusion, I here in this talk generally will steer clear of the phrase innate morality, Winnicott's phrase, which didn't mean for Winnicott but is usually meant by the term moral value. Instead, I shall refer to the intrinsic value in living in order to specify the primary feeling that life is worth living, as distinct from, the cultural, as distinct from cultural value in morality, religion, politics, and so on. The intrinsic value of living takes priority in this theory of value over morality, religion, and politics as forms of life. I'm suggesting, and further suggesting, it's the intrinsic value in living which underpins the idea, Monikot's argument, that military victory is tantamount to saving one's own skin. The political argument, in other words, is valuable for Winnicott precisely because it is not a moral argument. We fight as a matter of survival, but do not thereby claim to be better than our enemies. The use of the term enemy is decisive here. Some of these ideas are elaborated and set out in, in, in a recent publication, uh, in a book and a series of essays. It's the uh, attempt to rethink the idea of the enemy that m makes this paper uh, new for this evening, so I haven't really written about this a great length before. So the use of the term enemy is decisive here. In fact, I want to suggest a somewhat unlikely comparison between Winnie, Winnicott and Jean Genet, both of whom, it seems to me, address war in terms of a fundamental distinction between violence and brutality, <coughs> while at the same time according special significance to the humanity of the enemy. Genet set out the distinction between violence and brutality in his 1978 preface to a collection of writings by members of the Red Army faction. <coughs> in the preface, which was also published as an article in Le Mans, uh, Genet argued that life comprises, quote, innumerable examples of necessary violence. Uh, the spontane these are Genet Genet's phrases. The spontaneity and uninterrupted dynamic of which is infringed by systematic and organized acts of brutality, including the probing and intrusions of the state. By the spontaneous violence of life, Genet means, for instance, the kernel of wheat that germinates and breaks through the frozen earth, or the birth of a child, while he returns repeatedly in his writings to racism as a form of organized brutality. Similarly, Winnicott differentiates between violence as, quote, inherent in the primitive love impulse and the interruption of the continuity of being as a type of environmental brutality, or impingement, as Winnicott called it. While the latter, impingement or brutality, is necessarily harmful and cruel, there is nothing in the least peculiar or anomalous about a proclivity towards violence that is continuous with life itself. Prior to any discussion about, uh, prior to any discussion about what counts as, legitimate, as a legitimate use of violence, it seems to me that the basic distinction between violence and brutality is common to Winnicott and Genet. The further point I wish to make in, compar in comparing their work is that the spontaneous gesture of violence, understood as an expression of aliveness, allows for a perception of one's adversary as an enemy rather than prey, as to say, as a human being, rather than an animal to be hunted and slaughtered. Fidelity to the humanity of one's enemy, which Genet saw as integral to what he called the delicacy of relations in a paper on the 
given at a rally in support of the Black Panthers. Um, fidelity to the humanity of one's enemy doesn't necessarily rely on moral judgments of good and evil or psychologically derived notions of good and bad objects. As long as we fight to exist, we do not make any moral claims over and above the actions of our enemy. We do not, quote, this is Winkle, we do not, quote, assert that we have some quality that our enemies lack. The basic assumption here, for Winnicott at least, is that everybody in a state of health fights to exist and that we, do, and we are no better or worse than anybody else in this fundamental respect. Survival is what matters in a theory of human nature based on the intrinsic value in living. The question of moral value, as distinct from the intrinsic value in living, doesn't arise so long as strategy, in the 1940 paper, so long as strategy is identified with the reaching impulse of primary aggression. <coughs> At the most basic level in the human situation, violence is life, irrespective of what one thinks the good life ought to be. What matters isn't settled at the level of natural necessity, however. So there's a shift at this point in Winnicott's argument. Having proposed, having read Winnicott to be saying that the strategic argument presupposes the intrinsic value in living, the first argument, there's a move now at this point in Winnicott's paper. Again, rather kind of difficult to extract from the way Winnicott writes, but it's really given to arguments. But um, as you may know, um, but I'm suggesting though that the matter uh, of uh, the matters aren't settled at the level of, of natural necessity, as we called it. Morality and politics are active, um, albeit as derivative. I'm suggesting albeit as derivative formations of human value in rendering life as an historical phenomenon. So the move now is to, to the level of history. The same holds for Winnicott as for Genet. Physiology doesn't cover the whole of our perception of the enemy's humanity. We invariably perceive the enemy in historical and political as well as categorical terms, or, or if you will, existential terms, or ontological terms, I mean, any, any, any kind of categorical kind of construction um, of the enemy. Genet resisted. Genet resisted the brutalization of the enemy in siding with the Red Army faction in West Germany, the Black Panthers and the Palestinians. For Winnicott, the Nazis were identifiable as the enemy, including the mass leaders and intellectual sympathizers, as well as the anti-social elements in society that attracted to its ranks. Put simply, for Winnicott's generation, he was the enemy. He was someone you had to fight. And once again, the legitimacy of the strategic argument, this is that we find in the 1940 paper, the legitimacy of the strategic argument does not issue from a position of moral authority. But the question, for me at least, is does, does it accord, does the strategic argument, if it doesn't issue from moral authority, does it accord with the norms of moral conduct? Which seems to me to be a different question. On what grounds do we retain the perception of adversaries as enemies rather than prey? The question then of the enemy's humanity urges us to think through the proposition of war aims more carefully. And here, again, I'm proposing when he got supplemented the negative good of the political argument with its physiological substratum, one is no better than one's enemy. When he got supplementing the negative good with a positive good, allowing for the possibility that we do indeed stand for something that has moral or social value, further to the tactical manoeuvre of fighting just to win. Survival gives rise to something that feels worthwhile, the spontaneous violence of life, to a mature gesture of defiance. I'm introducing the notion of defiance alongside Winnicott's notion of compliance um, and seeing a struggle fought out um, on the underbelly of the psyche somatic structure of Winnicott's thinking at a historical level between, uh, between defiance and compliance.
In other words, the idea that there is more to survival than pugnacious combat, uh, more than the law of talent or retaliation, r raises the issue not only of what we stand for, but also of whether or not our standing for this or that presupposes a moral argument. Now, in some ways, this may seem oh, it's difficult to hear this, I realise, and it's, it's easier to, well, it may be easier to read it uh, if you have it in front of you, but I, I want to say that Winnicott does have a moral argument, but it, it, I think there's a danger of assuming the moral argument is given in the first move of, of the paper. Um, and then I think there's, there's a problem with that, and there's a moralisation of psychoanalysis that can follow from it, I think, and a particular way in which psychoanalytic concepts can take on a kind of moral connotation. I, I, I'm suggesting that Winnicott doesn't, um, I mean, knowing or unknowingly, explicitly or implicitly, I'm suggesting Winnicott doesn't actually fall into that particular trap. There's an argument which precedes the move to morality, but the, the move to morality is a fundamental part of the argument. So the idea that there is something more than uh, just fight, fighting, uh, you know, uh, retaliation raise, raises the issue not only of what we stand for, but uh, also whether our standing for this or that presupposes a moral argument. Winnicott maintained that we stand for something that is socially valuable, and we can think about the distinction between socially, politically, or morally, perhaps, if in our discussion. That we stand for something that's socially valuable in standing for democracy and freedom. Further to the intrinsic value in living, he counted, sorry, sorry, further to the intrinsic value in living, he counted these moral goods, he counted these as moral goods, freedom and democracy, things that matter in the outside world. The freedom of the individual he considered as permanently valuable. <coughs> there's nothing particularly, you know, there's nothing revelatory about this paper, written in 1904, very short paper, incidentally. Um, so I don't want to say that, that, that we can't forget we can go to this paper for, for particular innovations in, in moral theory or political philosophy, f far from it. But <coughs> the arrangement of the paper and the structure, the kind of architecture of the argument, if, if, uh, the architecture of the thinking, seems to me to be crucial. Um, and have, crucial, and have particular implications for psychoanalysis and its deployment outside of the clinic. So I propose that the perception of one's, I, I'm proposing that the perception of one's enemy is the litmus test of these secondary values. So that the argument moves from the intrinsic value in living to moral forms of life. But the Perception of one's enemy at the more fundamental level remains the litmus test of the so-called higher level. I don't know what quite to call them, higher level values, but uh, Jonathan Lear has recently called them in the current uh, in the current issue of the International Journal, International Journal of Psychoanalysis, um, life values, happiness, truthfulness, uh, the sense of reality, and so on. Suggesting the intrinsic value of living lies beneath those. Um, so the, uh, the perception of one's enemy then is, is, is a test, of, a fundamental test of these values. And <coughs> I wanted to quote at this point um, the following descriptions from Blunden's account in, in the encounter with the enemy in his book Undertones of War. So this is a quote from Edmund Blunder. <coughs> Quotes. Looking about in the now hazier October light, I saw some German prisoners drifting along. And I stopped them. One elderly gentleman had a jaw which seemed insecurely suspended, which I bound up with more skill with more will than skill and obtained the deep reward of a look so fatherly and hopeful <coughs> as seldom comes again." End of quote. London was writing about the song in 1928, in, 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 ten, ten years later. Indeed, I'm not quite sure. It's the 22nd today, I think, of October, and I, I think, I'm, I'm fairly certain that these, 
the, these quotes come out. I, I made a note, then lost the note in my mind somewhere, but it's, it's just come back. That, that, that these notes were made on the 20th of October 1918. Well, 1916, sorry. Elsewhere, uh, London describes how, quote, by the grace of God, suddenly two of the enemy from another direction wandered among them, among the soldiers, and surrendered. These prisoners duly arrived at battalion headquarters, seemingly half expecting to be eaten alive. A milkman and an elementary schoolmaster, most welcome guests, London describes them as. Our perception of the enemy as welcome guests prompts the question of moral value that otherwise remains elusive from a physiological perspective, from the physiological perspective of primary aggression. The intrinsic value of living gives rise to justice, precisely as recognition of the humanity of one's enemy raises matters above the power to hurt and the brute fact of retaliation. It will come as no surprise, perhaps, for me to say that babies aren't natural democrats. The most rudimentary distinction between me and not me relies on mine. Further to this, however, Winnicott, did, Winnicott didn't propose an opposition between ruthless love and human concern, but sought to ground the normativity of the moral in the value of our potential. And so far as he admits that we stand for something that is valuable, Winnicott's views about moral values are not inconsistent with his political argument as the sound basis for a discussion of war aims. Defending the idea of democracy as a moral good is not the same as presenting the defense of democracy as a good reason for war. And this is where I think the earlier distinction is important, the distinction between um, the intrinsic value in living and moral or political values. Because Winnicott's argument doesn't then cash out, um, to use a phrase, um, as a defense of the just war. Winnicott remained resolutely opposed to the idea of a just war in the name of democracy. And here's a quote again from the 1940 paper. It would be possible to take a community and to impose on it the machinery that belongs to democracy. But this would not be to create democracy. End of quote. In effect, uh, Genet came to the same conclusion the resistance to brutality remains vital insofar as it includes a resistance to the brutalization of freedom and democracy as resistant values rather than foundational acts. The spontaneous gesture of, the spontaneous gesture of life as violence, distinct from the brutal gesture of impingement, allows us to think life itself as freedom, distinct from a pure idea, or, or a human right. I recently come from a, week, a conference at the weekend where people were given 20 minutes and they simply just refused to recognize the, the order of time. Um, I, I want to stop and give time, but I have more than enough to say. So I, I'm happy to stop at any point which may be useful. Would it be helpful to stop about 10 too? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I could go on for longer, but I think there's, you know, there's, there's more than enough to think about perhaps already. The imposition of democratic freedom, which amounts to the brutalization of the values of freedom and democracy, isn't something uh, Winnicott tried to pass off as a positive good under the guise of a political argument. The principles of freedom and democracy, for which Winnicott believed the war was being fought, were not used to invest the war itself with a just meaning. Winnicott continued to believe, sorry, continued in the belief that war is unjustifiable. We cannot extrapolate from his argument any certain good concerning our willingness to fight, even where the war is fought against the enemies of freedom and democracy. The idea of British supremacy makes no sense when looked at from the point of view of the fundamental human situation. I think is being sketched out in this 1940 paper. Winnicott continued to subscribe to the idea of a strategic imperative while claiming that we are more humane than our adversaries insofar as we, quote, 
aim at a more mature stage of emotional development rather than our enemies do. Now this, again, is the second real fault line in the paper. I said at the beginning it seemed to, well, I'm, I'm suggesting anyway, that the argument of the theory of value, or the outline of the theory of value really, to be more accurate, that's in the 1940 paper is based on you know, two distinctions between brutality and violence um, and the idea of necessity and maturity at the beginning of the talk. Winnicott, I think, derives, or at least I've read Winnicott, in order for myself to derive a theory of the enemy. It certainly refers to the enemy throughout the paper. A theory of the enemy, an idea, a, a, a recognition, a perception of the enemy, I'm calling it. And that's derived from this first distinction between brutality and violence. When, when, he, when the paper then moves to talking about and deploying the idea of maturity and the criterion of maturity, Winnicott then uh, derives from that a, a different kind of argument, no longer about the enemy, but about the usefulness of war as a form of maturation, which is a different argument. And if I can, within the, you know, I'd, I'd like just to sketch that perhaps before we, we stop and, and talk. Um, and it's here, in that, and it's in that quote that I just that just uh, recalled. Um, Perhaps if I may, I'll just read this again then. Winnicott continue, uh, sorry, Winnicott, con what did Winnicott do? I continue to subscribe to the idea of a strategic imperative while claiming that we are more humane than our adversaries insofar as we aim at a more mature stage of emotional development than our enemies do. Value derives from the fact of recognizing the humanity of our enemies, even where they succumb, even where they succumb to brutality. At the same time, there is no moral value in the willingness to fight, where will amounts to no more than a physiological term. Moral value resides, rather, in the aims that move us to fight beyond the will to survive, and as such, promise to take us beyond the battlefront. Winnicott, in other words, didn't subscribe to the idea that we are continuously and permanently at war with one another but maintained a rigorous distinction between ruthlessness and brutality. Okay, so if we could move then, perhaps in the next 10 minutes or so, then, to, 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 to talk more specifically about the meaning of necessarily violence in Winnicott's theory. Uh, in a, 19, a paper published in 1945, uh, entitled The Primit Primitive Emotional Development, a seminal paper of Winnicott's, which has been written about you know, great length um, and, and, and with, with a good deal of, you know, usefully and, and very wisely, I think. But Ogden has an interesting paper on it. And, well, there are, there are many papers. Um, Winnicott postulated an early ruthless object relationship as distinct from sadism and brutality or the power to hurt. I don't know that this paper has been linked, it may have been, but I don't know of the fact of it being linked to the, the to the theme of war. And yet the link seems clear enough to me, and the dates are what they are. The ruthless self, so to speak, is described as aggressive in particular in violent ways. The baby hurts its mother and wears her out. But even as the baby goes at its mother in a savage way, Winnicott maintains that it isn't driven by innate destructiveness. Rather, he equates the, cre the reaching impulse, Winnicott's phrase, with life. And then a quote from Winnicott. When a baby go goes, uh, when a baby goes from the breast and drinks milk, in fantasy, he puts his hands in, goes for the breast, that should be. Um, in fantasy, he puts his hands in, or dives into, or tears, his way into his mother's body, according to the strength of the impulse and its ferocity, and takes from her breast whatever is good there. I mean, not dissimilar from some of the descriptions of clients, of course, but the way in which the description is being deployed is fundamentally different. Um, but the description itself is, is, is familiar.
On this crucial point, the distinction between primary aggression and the death drive, or between violence, understood as an uninterrupted dynamic that is life itself, and acts of brutality, underpin pins the political distinction between strategic and non-strategic arguments. Together, the two sets of distinctions, existential and political, underscore the use of maturity as a general evaluative principle for Nico. In the context of war, the criterion of maturity proves decisive in allowing for a, a distinction between political aims and moral values. In particular, it vouches for the idea that while we stand for things that have moral value and that matter, including the freedom of the individual, and the concomitant sense of insecurity that I already referred to, we do not necessarily stand for these things on moral grounds. The existential distinction between violence, or primary aggression, and brutality is part and parcel of the strategic argument. Standing for something that matters is not seen as inimical to the use of violence. But neither does it legitimate the use of violence on moral grounds. Indeed, further to the substantive question of what we stand for, or what matters, Winnicott made a case for war on psychological now as well as political grounds. He argued that, quote, we could show that the Nazis are behaving like adolescents or pre-adolescents, if we could show that they're behaving like adolescents or pre-adolescents, whereas we are behaving like adults, we should have a good case, Winnicott claimed, end of quote. Now, whether or not one agrees with the substance of this claim, the criterion of maturity, again, nonetheless presupposes a further distinction between political motives, conscious and unconscious, and moral values. I want to say, and you know, let's, let's perhaps talk about this as well if, if, if you wish, that Winnicott's discussion of war aims is not contradictory, but complex, irreducibly complex, comprising a threefold distinction with respect to political calculations, substratum of physiology, psychological motives, psychological motives, and moral values. I don't think there is anything comparable to this uh, set of distinctions in Freud's critique of morality. Yeah. Basically, you know, morals and religion in Freud, uh, as, the, as the cause of torment and his related insistence on the discipline of necessity. I'm, clear, I'm passing over the subtlety of Freud's argument, and that's something we might want to come back to, but I think it's the weakest part of Freud's work uh, in, 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 across the board, really, a critique of religion and, and morals. For Winnicott, although we may stand for democracy and freedom as moral goods, the morality of these values is not the issue when it comes to understanding why we wage war. Psychologically speaking, it is consistent that we fight for our lives and behave like mature adults. It's consistent to make both those claims. This is not a moral justification of war, but the defense of oneself and society along political and psychological lines. Conversely, social defense is not essentially part of Winnicottian ethics so much as a supplementary argument. The comparison that I've made here uh, with Genet's posture of defiance, contra-brutality, contra may also be applied to Levinas. There's a long piece on Levinas here that I won't go into. I think it just take us too far, far afield. Um, let, let, let me conclude then. That, well, I'll be finishing more or less on 10.2. Okay. We, we call, um, I'm then this last claim, um, argue that fighting itself may be a condition of our maturity. This goes beyond that perception of the enemy as, a, as welcome guests. This is a different argument. And renders the encounter as a maturational task. Again, a 1940 paper has this to tell us. Quote, on mutual respect between maturing men who have fought each other, a new period of peace could be reached, perhaps lasting another couple of decades, till the new generation grows up and again seeks to solve or obtain relief from its own problems in its own ways, end of quote. 
as with Genet's irreducible gesture of defiance, Winnicott's stance affords some grounds for hope, but not for a final end to war. The optimism, in Winnicott's argument, is burdened with the claim that it's not for others to sacrifice themselves for our freedom. And there's no reason to believe that Winnicott revised these views in the light of subsequent historical events, 20th century events, views that belie the image of a sentimental thinker. The sweet, kind image of the analyst as a good mother, or a perfect mother, as I once heard Winnicott described by Hannah Siegel, is altogether misguided. Predicated on the criterion of maturity, the argument Winnicott set out in 1940 makes an uncompromising case for war on strategic grounds, but also as an existential right of passage. The idea of war as unavoidable, coupled with the idea of individual freedom as permanently valuable, <coughs> implies that military action may, under certain conditions, actually facilitate maturational processes. Now, while Nietzsche is beyond Winnicott's ken in all kinds of ways, the idea of the free man, quote, as a warrior, quote, is integral to Winnicott's 1940 paper and elsewhere. Um, he envisaged, Winnicott envisaged maturity not only as a psychological process, but also as an historical encounter along the lines of survival and security. And to end then with this quote, allocation of war guilt has no part in this scheme, since all share it for peace, spells, impotence, except one through fighting and the personal risk of death. Thank you very much.